Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our virtual conversations. I am Gisela Carbonell. I am the curator of the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College. I want to welcome you to this virtual event and remind you that we have a series of upcoming virtual events for the rest of the summer. So make sure you follow us on social media, on Instagram, at Facebook, and of course on our website um, to get messages and notices of the upcoming events. Today, we are delighted to have with us Dr. Grant Hamming, who is American Art Research Fellow at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum. As part of a project funded by a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation, he is researching the museum's collection of art by American artists with the goal of making information on all of the nearly 1,400 works in the American collection available for use by students, faculty, and members of the community. Dr. Hamming graduated from Stanford University with a doctorate in the history of art in 2016, and his dissertation enti entitled Amerikanischer Malkasten, American Art and Dusseldorf, examined the group of American artists, including uh, Albert Bierstadt, the subject of today's talk, who lived and worked in Dusseldorf, uh, then part of Prussia, during the decades before the American Civil War. Uh, so before I turn it over to Dr. Hamming, I want to remind you that if you have questions or comments, please submit them on the, um, through the chat box. And Dr. Hamming will address those after his talk. So um, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Hamming. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Stella, for the introduction and the Henry Luce Foundation for funding uh, the American Art Research and my position. Today, I'll be talking about Shoshone Indians' Rocky Mountain, an oil sketch by the American painter Albert Bierstadt that is installed in the exhibition, The Place is Metaphor, here at CFAM, or there at CFAM. I'm starting off with these installation views of the exhibition because this talk was originally scheduled to be at the museum, and I would like us all to transport ourselves intellectually and spiritually to the galleries where it would have taken place. A museum exhibition is a conversation, one between and among works of art, curators, and museum visitors. And this is part of that conversation. And I hope you will continue it with me after in the Q&A. But also I want to show you this view because an important aspect of looking at works of art, one that's totally lost over PowerPoint, as any art history professor will tell you, especially on individual laptop and phone screens, is their physical presence. The work that we're going to be talking about today, as these views I hope show, uh, is tiny. Many, many of you, many of us, many people, I would hazard to guess, might walk right by it, uh, tempted by the more outwardly impressive works of art that surround it. Perhaps you might notice the elaborate gilt frame uh, surrounding this image, which is like five by seven inches, and wonder why such a dinky painting deserved a frame like that, and then move on to something else. Why, you may be tempted to ask, am I going to spend my time, and yours, talking about such a tiny, insignificant object? By way of an answer, I'm showing you these images. On the left is Albert Bierstadt's mansion, which he built in Terrytown on the Hudson River in upstate New York. He called it Malkassen, which is a German word meaning paint box, and which also was the name of an artist club he belonged to while he was studying in Germany. It also burned to the ground in 1882, which was sadly common in the 19th century taking with it a huge number of completed or in-progress paintings, a ton of memorabilia from his travels in Europe and the American West, and most unfortunately for art historians, most of his sketchbooks and other preparatory materials. So when I got here to see FAM for the first time and saw this on the wall, I was blown away. To have a Bierstadt oil sketch and such a good one from such an important time in his career is a really rare and wonderful thing. And so I wanna share that with you all today. Before I begin, I wanted to talk about my title, Wyoming Skies with Dusseldorf Eyes. Uh, if you're familiar with Bierstadt and his work, it's like for, likely for his landscape painting of the American West, the Rockies, the Sierras, Yosemite, San Francisco Bay, and similar natural wonders. As we delve deeper into his life today, I hope to show you how he learned to paint the way he did, and how his training in a small city called Dusseldorf prepared him to make these massive canvases. So the German-American painter Albert Bierstadt, as I said, is best known for his large-scale images of the American West. 
images which made him among the most celebrated painters in the United States in the 1860s and 1870s. For example, among the Sierra Nevada, California, is absolutely huge. It's the size of a wall and not a small wall. Uh, it's six feet high by 10 feet wide. And I bet there are many of us for whom, definitely me, this would not fit in our house, certainly not on the wall, probably wouldn't even get in the front door. Uh, so these paintings, they're like the James Cameron movies of their days. They're big, they're loud, they're meant to blot out your senses and allow you to focus on nothing but the grandeur in front of you. And this painting is not unusual at all. Um, in fact, this is something like Bierstadt's standard size from the 1860s and 1870s, when he was selling these left and right to rich people on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, after all, the new class of industrialists in the later 19th century had big new mansions, so they needed big new paintings to put on the walls. And just like James Cameron movies, these paintings were also made according to a kind of formula, one the audience understood and took delight in understanding. Take, for example, the little dirt path you can see towards the bottom right of the painting. That's a common feature of landscape paintings of this era. And once you notice it, you'll start to see it everywhere in museums. Uh, so that path was meant to help literally draw the viewer to, into the work, to enable them to imagine themselves entering the fictive space of the painting, to participate in the wonders it's showing. And so these paintings also usually featured something human scaled to enable further identification. So in this case, it's these deer that you can see along the, um, the water there that are kind of the same size as people that allow you to imagine yourself in the scale of the painting. Uh, often they're actually people. And so you see this reflection of the light on the water uh, here, which snakes further back into space. And this, this kind of S-curved line was enabling the viewer kind of intellectually further to see themselves moving in to the painting where it meets the, land, uh, the waterfall there, which helps lead you up through the mountains and into this, this kind of gloriously lit sky. So the exact method of accomplishing this varies for each painting. But this is the standard formula. Um, same, the, the kind of vertical elements on the edges of the canvas do similar work to funnel the viewer's attention in towards the painting. Um, and so viewers were aware of this formula, just like we're aware that the heroes in the action movie face their worst danger just before they reach their biggest triumph. So uh, keep that in mind as we go through that this is something that would have been very legible to its viewer. So, the work here at CFAM, on the other hand, is not on so grand a scale. Uh, though one of the key themes of this talk will be the relationship between small works such as this one and the large scale ones, which you can see in other museums. In fact, this picture, in which we see a pair of teepees, a couple of dogs, and three groupings of human figures situated in front of the vast open plains of the West with mountains in the further distance, it's actually a sketch. And in particular, it seems to be a sketch for a large scale work called Rocky Mountains, Lander's Peak which is part of the American collection at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, in this painting, groups of Shoshone people, you can see throughout the foreground, are strewn about a grassy plain. As the viewer's eyes move through that, those landscape conventions back into the fictive space created by the painting, it moves through a series of landscape features, including a glassy pool, a dramatic waterfall, a series of foothills, and finally, the titular peak, which is a real mountain stands over 10,000 feet tall uh, in the Wind River Range in what is today Wyoming. And all of this is capped off quite literally with stirring expanses of white fluffy clouds interspersed throughout the, the bright icy blue of the sky. And yet Shoshone Indians Rocky Mountains also shares a lot of features in common with what we would consider a finished oil painting as opposed to a sketch. A fact which becomes clear when we examine Hudson River scene, a slightly later painting by the New Jersey-based American landscape painter named, named Mary Josephine Walters, which is installed as part of the place of metaphor. Uh, so if we were in the gallery right now, I would be like walking back and forth between the two paintings to talk about them. But through the magic of, of PowerPoint, we have them here right next to each other. Um, the, the Walters is actually about two or three times the size of the Beardstein, but PowerPoint. Um, so in both works, a broad sweep of placid water serves to draw the viewer's eye into the scene, from which it is further funneled by vertical elements, cliffs and woods on the Walters to the right and individual trees in the Bierstadt on the left. Human scaled elements, figural groups in the Bierstadt, uh, canoes in the Walters, 
further urge the viewer to imagine themselves entering the scene, traveling freely into the wilderness of Wyoming or the Catskills, depending on the painting. Thus, Shoshone Indian's Rocky Mountains is really a wonderful hybrid object. In it, Bierstadt is working out ideas he will use in one of his large-scale landscape paintings, in fact, the very first of these giant Western scenes for which he's most known, but also stands by itself as a painting in its own right. So we'll return to Shoshone Indians and the American landscape soon enough. But first I would like to rewind the clock a bit to 1853, when Albert Bierstadt first arrives in the Prussian city of Dusseldorf at the age of 23. So Dusseldorf uh, is a, is a medium-sized city in, on, on the Rhine in Northwest Germany. Um, and at the time, it was a, a, a small city of about 30,000 people. Uh, and in general, it's not known today as one of the world's great art centers. It doesn't have the reputation of Paris or New York or London or even Munich and Berlin, other German cities that were popular destinations and places for artists to live in the 19th century. But there was a time, roughly dating from the 1830s to 1870 or so, when the Kunstakademie Dusseldorf, uh, which still exists today and has, some famous, has had some famous artists associated with it over the years, was one of the most famed in all of Europe and was a particular draw for students from the United States. They were attracted by the curriculum at the academy, which emphasized rigorous drawing and a detailed sharp-edged realism, which you can see, um, which was aligned with American artist, artistic taste in the years before the Civil War, and which this painting, I think, is a good example of. Uh, they were also attracted by Dusseldorf's culture, which was, uh, Dusseldorf had been captured by Napoleon relatively early in the Napoleonic Wars, and he had installed the Napoleonic Code, which was a liberal set of governing reforms that the Prussians had allowed to stay in place after they uh, were awarded it in the uh, peace after the war. So anyway, this work, Atelier Zine, or Studio Scene, by the German painter Johann Peter Hassenklaver, kind of illustrates some of those cultural things. There were a few women who were studying at the Kunstakademie, but by and large, the, the students were all men. And like students before and since, they were there to party. You know, uh, another famous German-American painter, Emanuel Leutze, who painted Washington crossing the Delaware, among others, kept a, a, a cannon and a tapped keg of beer in his studio. And when visitors would come into the studio, they would be greeted from a blast from the cannon. One hopes no shot was in the cannon, just gunpowder, but even so. Um, and another American, Worthington Whitridge, once posed for so long while serving as an artist model that he almost passed out until his friends poured champagne down his throat, which he said allowed him to carry on. Um, the artists frequently went on picnics and bird shooting trips together, and the, uh, the museums and archives in Dusseldorf are just full of these images of these, of these guys partying together, especially the Malkots and the Artist Club. There are all sorts of drawings and, and fun stuff like that. So this picture shows some of that, too. There are pipes and other tobacco detritus all over the floor. There are guys who are there just to hang out in addition to making paintings, um, and you can see the guy on the right is, is smoking from this really big, elaborate ceramic pipe, which was very popular. You'll see them all throughout uh, images of and by Dusseldorf artists. Uh, there's a guy harassing the poor maid in the back who's bringing in, you know, coffee service or something. Um, even the scene being painted, this, the model is holding up a big bottle of wine, like maybe he's about to take a slug out of it. So, you know, they're having a good time. They're enjoying themselves. And then... This piece is also interesting because uh, Hassenklaver was, uh, was Bierstadt's cousin. So Bierstadt was born in Solingen, which is a, a smaller city just outside Dusseldorf. Um, he had immigrated to the United States with his family when he was like two. Uh, and so Bierstadt originally traveled to Dusseldorf to study with Hassenklaver and become a genre painter to paint scenes of everyday life. Uh, but Hassenklaver died before Bierstadt got there. Another one of those 19th century hazards, people just up and die um, in the weeks that it takes you to travel to see them. So when he arrives, Bierstadt doesn't quite know what to do. Uh, he doesn't have the mentor he was expecting to work with. Luckily for him, there were other Americans already there, including Leutze and this painter, Worthington Wittridge, who was the champagne guy I talked about a minute ago. Um, Wittridge's autobiography is one of the richest surviving sources on the lives of the Dusseldorf painters, in particular the Americans. Um, and in it, he writes that Bierstadt, upon finding his presumed mentor dead, 
tried to apprentice himself to a landscape painter named Andreas Achenbach instead. Um, Leute and Wittrich, taking a look at the drawings that Bierstadt had brought along, decided that he lacked talent. And in order to spare his feelings from Achenbach rejecting him, they told him that Achenbach wasn't taking any students. So Bierstadt wasn't deterred, however. Uh, he, he could have just head home, headed home back to, to, to Massachusetts. But instead, he took the initiative and set off up the Rhine River for the summer. And he returned in the fall with a huge number of sketches. And according to Wittridge, such an improvement in his technique that they could scarcely believe it was still him. Um, so Wittridge took him on as a student himself. And he writes that when Bierstadt first started sending paintings back home to New Bedford to sell, uh, the local paper accused him of having sent back Lessing or Achenbach, some other German painter's work, passing it off as his own. And so Leutze and Wittridge and a couple of the German painters had to write a letter saying, no, 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 this is really Bierstadt's stuff. He's really gotten that good. It's OK. Um, so this anecdote, in addition to being pretty charming, demonstrates something important, something which a focus only on Bierstadt's large finished paintings might overlook. Namely, it's that sketching was absolutely foundational to Bierstadt's practice. It's quite literally how he learned his trade, and it helps us understand everything that came after. Bierstadt's sketchbook from that first summer in Germany doesn't survive, but luckily one of his ones from the next year, 1854, does. And so we were able to see some of his work from this formative time in his career. The sketch is a far cry from Shoshone Indians, Rocky Mountains. It's definitely the work of someone who's still figuring things out. You know, it's, it's a little rough around the edges. I, I, I personally can't draw, and those little tree swiggles seem like something I might have done. But at the same time, it's valuable, uh, and not just because it shows us how far he came between the, in the five years between 1854 to 1859 when he makes the sketch here at CSAM. For one thing, it's proof that he stood in the spot wherever it is. But anyway, it's a pretty basic sketch. You can see he's mostly interested in working out the broad strokes of the scene he sees from this vantage point. Quick swiggles, as I said, for the trees, bits of darker graphite here and there for buildings or shadows. At the same time, this sketch demonstrates how much Bierstadt already understands the conventions of landscape painting. If you look at these lines to the lower right, you can see that's kind of that path I told you about where it draws your eye into the scene. Um, and he's building up the vertical elements, especially on the right. Uh, the French term for that is repoussoir. That's helping to funnel the viewer's vision, to concentrate the viewer's vision. And there's a little white S-curve of river or road or something that's that key middle ground detail that's, that's connecting this, this um, foreground that's so inviting to the viewer to the background, which is uh, further away. So it's not clear if he ever made a painting of this scene. There aren't a ton of his um, paintings from when he was in Germany still around, but he probably didn't because his goal here really isn't to make a finished painting. It's to start to figure things out. To work, to work out how he's going to represent a landscape, how he's going to, um, to represent forms and shape and light. Uh, but he could have referred to it as he made other paintings. And the things he saw and recorded here would have helped him even as he worked out other scenes as aids to remembering the trick of light or even where to stand in front of some other pretty view in order to capture the best vision of it. So in the same sketchbook, he also is beginning to work out how he would draw human figures, as well as other objects like the cart that you can see at the bottom half of the page. Uh, and these pages are small, you know, five by seven inches again, a uh, little, little book. Um, so we can see here he's working with a little more detail, but still mostly working in kind of outline and form, more elemental basic aspects of things. How do human bodies look when they're sitting in different shapes, when they're standing in front of one another? Um, but you can see he's also starting to do a little bit of detail, like in the pipe, one of those big, long Dusseldorf pipes on the guy in the, the farthest on the right. Um, but he's catching impressions. He's building his artistic vocabulary that he can draw on over and over so that even when he's painting a Shoshone person in the West, he already knows how to represent crossed legs or uh, kneeling or anything like that, hats. And then, Finally, in this sketchbook, there are sketches like this one. And so as you can see, he's moving in closer here, drawing a single person, representing more detail, like the decorative work on the, on the uh, you know, jug that she's resting her hand on, 
some of these um, some of these shadows. So he, there's less graphite, less pure line here. He's incorporating watercolor, value, shade. Um, but he's still also looking very carefully at, for example, the light source. You can see these really strong shadows show that he's really interested in figuring out how do you represent light that's so strong that this woman has to, you know, shield her arms at it. So, so you know, uh, he's getting pretty good. And if the first of those couple of sketches might have made us worry about young Albert's future prospects, this is a good drawing. He's really, he's really getting it. So what we can see in this sketchbook is the process of Bierstadt's dialing in, of working out both the large forms that will constitute the broad outlines of his oil paintings, but also of increasingly minute details. A knock on Bierstadt during his time, and one that has persisted a bit in the scholarly literature about him, is that he was great at landscapes and other big, wide open features, but that he struggled with the detail. And I think one thing that we really gain from looking at his sketch practice in depth, I think, is that this is unkind to him. This notebook is from 1854, just a year or so into his formal study of art, and he's already figuring out exactly what he needs to do to put together the kinds of paintings he's going to end up making, both in terms of big formal ideas and the smaller details. And in 1858, just after he gets back to Massachusetts from Dusseldorf, and based on sketches he made while he was still in Europe, a lot of the Americans were traveling uh, in, they would travel up and down the Rhine in the Hartz Mountains in Germany, but also to Switzerland and, and Rome. Um, he makes this his first real large scale masterpiece. Uh, so this is Lake Lucerne, the famous Swiss lake in the Alps. And it's got all those key uh, aspects of landscape painting from this era, from the road that leads the viewer in, to the repoussoir trees and the S-curve in the middle ground. He sent it to the National Academy of Design annual exhibition in New York, which is undoubtedly the most art important art show in the United States. And it causes an absolute sensation. This, this thing's huge. This is one of these six by 10 feet masterpieces, monstrosities. Uh, so he's gone in five years from a 23 year old who was seen as having so little talent that he had no future in art um, to one of the most exciting and celebrated young artists of his day. And it's all built on this foundation of sketching, of getting out into the world and putting pencil, charcoal, and watercolor on paper. So normally the thing to do for an American artist who's just let, hit it big at the National Academy of Design exhibition is to move to New York and start making paintings to sell there. Undoubtedly the biggest market for American artists then, just as it is now. And Bierstadt does do that. But he takes a very unusual detour first. He attaches himself to a Western survey expedition commanded by a guy named, a colonel named Frederick Lander, and he's going through Nebraska and Wyoming. Uh, and he didn't just accompany Lander, he also sent correspondence and images back east for publication in newspapers and magazines, including Harper's Weekly, like the image you see here. He was one of the first artists to do something like this, in particular to have his work published in the popular press in this way. In this image, you can see how he's starting to set the visual style that would become associated with the depictions of American West for decades, even to this day. Um, you've got sort of a group of Native American people sitting in a circle. You've got a, a settlement or perhaps a, a native village on the other side of the water. You've got these Conestoga wagons making their way sort of into the distance. And this is one of several based on his drawings that was published in Harper's. Um, and, and this is really, a key aspect of Bierstadt's, um, to put it in modern terms, his marketing plan. Uh, so during the 19th century, like no time before, landscape painters were expected to go out into the world and base their images on that world. Uh, this isn't the Impressionists taking their easels out into the world, in, into the landscape and making finished paintings. Um, the, the painters are still making, they're spending the summer traveling, making sketches, um, and then they come back to the studio and all winter they paint the paintings in New York, uh, the finished paintings. But they're making lots of sketches. They're often going to the vacation destinations where their patrons are, so that if you're, you know, you want to sell a painting of Bar Harbor, you know that the people who, have, who are at Bar Harbor have seen you there and you're friends with them. So it's all, it's all about this building of relationships. Um, so, you know, he's doing this out in the West, which is such a new and unique thing to do. And I want you to notice that standing Native American 
woman as part of that grouping in the foreground. And for me, she's really the key, the key person in this scene. Um, so she's looking directly at us and, and looking and kind of, she, as part of the landscape, part of the scene, she's engaging directly with the viewer. So sitting in their parlor in the East Coast, the, the person reading Harper's can have something of the direct encounter with the exotic West that Bierstadt has had. He can know that when he looks at a Bierstadt, it is based on real experience, this kind of one-to-one -one connection with the artist. So as I said, in taking this trip and sending his dispatches back, Bierstadt was engaged in some savvy marketing of his work. He was telling potential patrons in New York that anything he made for them was based on the real thing, on direct observation. He was selling, in other words, authenticity. If someone came to visit him in his studio, first in Manhattan, in the, frame, in the famed 10th Street studio building, and then later at Malkowson up in Tar Tarrytown, they would see all the things he'd brought back on his travels, all his memorabilia, all his uh, artifacts, his skins, all that kind of stuff. And they could look at his sketches and look at his paintings that are in progress. And so most of, this said I, as I, most of this stuff, as I said, was tragically lost in a fire. But these images give you kind of a sense of what the experience of visiting Bierstadt was like, how you could get caught up in the romance of the West that he's selling. So as I said, I believe Shoshone Indians Rocky Mountains, the sketch at CFAM, um, was part of Bierstadt's preparatory materials for Rocky Mountains Landers Peak. And I say that despite the fact that this scene, this exact scene does not appear anywhere in the final painting. But if you look at uh, the CFAM sketch next to a detail of the uh, fin finished painting kind of demonstrates what I mean. In both, there are groups of Shoshone people spread out over the landscape, surrounded by their dwellings and their animals. Small groups like the two dogs in the sketch seem to kind of rhyme with the, um, with the, the dogs in the, the finished painting, although one of the dogs here in the finished painting is lying down dead or, or maybe hopefully just asleep. Um, the color scheme in particular, that used to represent the people is very similar, as is the location of the teepees next to a shimmering, beautiful body of water. But at the same time, there are some differences, right? The CFAM sketch is less finished. There isn't as much detail. Uh, he's still kind of blocking out form more than interested in putting in these final details. He's kind of saving his, his facility for detail for the final piece, for when it really counts. And count it did. So remember Lake Lucerne? the painting that he finished when he got back from Dusseldorf to Massachusetts. Uh, he sold that to a collector in Boston for $925 after it was exhibited at the National Academy, which was a pretty good price for a painting at that time, although, you know, he spent a lot of time on that thing. It's, it's huge, remember. Um, Rocky Mountain's Lander's Peak, on the other hand, was the first painting he made after he returned from the Lander Expedition and moved to New York. It wasn't finished until 1863, so it took him four years to do it. But the wait was worth it because he sold it for $25,000, the largest sum ever paid for an American painting to that point. Uh, it's a little hard to translate prices from that time to today, but roughly speaking, it's equivalent to about $500,000 today. So like, you know, four years work, but for a pretty big payoff. And it, this painting caused another of these absolute sensations. And he embarked on, he had to go back west to get more source material to paint more paintings. And for the rest of his career, well, at least until he fell out of favor, tastes changed then as they do now, um, he would make so many of these, selling them for that price, that standard price, uh, to the East Coast and European elite. Uh, and he just filled all the mansions of, of the kind of transatlantic elite with these big visions of the West. And so it's absolutely crucial to this story that the vision of Lander's Peak, which is now called Lander Peak, that Bierstadt shows us is simply not a recording of nature. It's an oil painting, and one that takes considerable liberties with the scenery. The real peak is quite impressive, a craggy rock jutting just above the mountains around it with a, a placid lake at its base. Yet it is not so tall in the painting, and it is not flanked by other impressive mountains. The flanking mountains in the painting are like bigger, more impressive than the real thing here. Uh, this photo is from a bit closer vantage point than the painting, and I'm willing to concede that there could be a different, more impressive angle, one that captures a waterfall and some other cool features. If you're from Wyoming or you've been to Lander Peak, uh, you know, let me know. But even then, this is just not the same level of grandeur that Bierstadt portrays in the painting. 
And so that brings me back to the place as metaphor, the exhibition in which Shoshone Indians Rocky Mountains, the Our Little Oil sketch, appeared. The sketch, just like the finished painting, presents just one such metaphor. That metaphor is one that sees the West not simply as a real place, but as a wonderland, a place where city-bound East Coasters can experience the full majesty of God's creation. In representing the West in this way, Bierstadt is both participating in and helping to shape the discourse of manifest destiny, this ideology that says white Americans are the, the natural uh, occupants of North America. They can spread out from sea to shining sea and possess the land. Uh, and the other metaphor, the one that the sketch really helps us see, is one of authenticity, the idea that a painting or other work of art can represent the experience of being in a place. And as we've seen, Bierstadt's finished paintings don't tend to represent real places accurately, or even really try to. That's why this sketch is so precious. More so than the finished paintings, this sketch is tied to a particular place that Bierstadt saw on his travels. It probably wasn't made in the studio, but rather in the field, with an easel and paints that he carried with him on his horse. That means it helps us to return to that moment, to imagine ourselves with him somewhere in Wyoming. It's also tiny, on a much more intimate scale than his finished work. If those finished works try to blow you out, overwhelm your senses, this one invites you in, promises an intimate experience. So the next time you, you get to come to see Fam, which hopefully will be soon, take some time and have that intimate experience. Thank you. And for thank you so much, Dr. Hamming, for that incredible, wonderful presentation of this piece by Bierstadt. So if there are questions, please submit them in the um, through the chat box or the Q&A box um, for Grant. I was wondering, um, as, as I was looking at the images, if there are any um, writings or notes that he left behind about any of the um, people that he depicted. I'm going back to that drawing that you were um, highlighting of that uh, female figure looking out of the viewer and acknowledging the viewer's presence um, in that scene with her, if there's any information that he left behind about specific people that he depicted or any anecdotes or narrative. Right. There is, um, there is record, mostly published in Harper's and also in, uh, he wrote to a lot of the New Bedford papers, which are, uh, not super easy to track down. A lot of them are, are on microfilm and not online. But anyway, um, he 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 does write about um, some of that kind of stuff. And but a lot of it is this very generalized language about um, about you know the disappearing noble people who are soon to be. You know, he urges the recording of of the disappearing Indians, the way that is so familiar for for uh, how white Americans talk in this period. Um, actually, in a in, in his his second trip, he goes with this guy named Fitzhugh Ludlow, who's this kind of really amazing eccentric. He, he one of his books was called was a, he wrote a book about his travels with Bierstadt, but he also wrote a book called uh, Confessions of a Hashish Eater. He he was inspired by the British writer Thomas De Quincey, who wrote Confessions of an Opium Eater. So Ludlow was apparently taking heroic doses of marijuana and writing about the hallucinations he was having. But anyway, on his trip with Bierstadt, he, um, he writes a lot about Bierstadt as a painter and how Bierstadt worked. So there's a lot of really rich detail about Bierstadt, but as is so often the case with these things, less so about the people that he met, which is un unfortunate and pretty typical for the time period. Thank you. There's a question, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a question in the Q&A box. Um, someone is asking, is Frederick Lander was a German, uh, a German American? So I don't know that off the top of my head, but his name is spelled Frederick, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K, uh, not Friedrich. So I don't think so, but I, I don't know. G the German, Germany was uh, a primary source of immigrants to the United States. Uh, especially in this period. So it's always possible, but I, I don't know. Sorry. Um, and thank you all for submitting these questions. There's another question um, here. What inspired him to paint scenes 
with the Shoshone Indians? And did he do photography as well as paint? Am I back? Okay. Yeah. I'm back. Sorry, my internet is it is what it is, I guess. It's okay. <laughs> So the question is, what inspired him to paint scenes with the Shoshone Indians, and did he do photography as well as paint? Um, so Bierstadt, um, he painted the Shoshone because that those were the people who were indigenous to eastern Wyoming, the, the Wyoming Rockies and the, the plains around them, uh, where he was visiting. So later, he does images on the California coast of some of the indigenous people that are there. Um, and often, he, it, actually something I write about in my dissertation is how he increasingly doesn't include Native Americans in his paintings. It's as if he's uh, rhetorically and intellectually and ideologically moving on from them. And he starts actually showing white settlements a little bit more or like emigrants crossing the plains. Uh, Ludlow writes of Bierstadt and him meeting a group of, of, of Schwabians, of Germans, who are, or maybe even Westphalians, which is where Dusseldorf is. Um, so uh, he painted the Shoshone because they were there when he was there. Um, and sorry, what was the second half of the question? Um, so there's another question: if he also um, if he also did photography? Oh yeah, painting. So you might have noticed in uh, th that this photograph is by Charles Bierstadt, who is his brother. And um, for a while, there was actually a photography company called Bierstadt Brothers. And so he basically bankrolled his brother in business. Um, but so photography was actually a key aspect of uh, his practice. As you can see, like this, this picture, he's selling a picture of his studio. His brother's selling a picture of, of Albert's studio as like a souvenir. Um, but also they were making stereographs, which are these kinds of photographs where it's two slightly different images that you put on like a, a viewer and um, they they come together to form a kind of 3D image, the 3D glasses of its day. And so Bierstadt was absolutely, he and his brother were absolutely taking photographs, uh, absolutely a huge part of his um, practice. But I do think a lot of that was also lost um, when the, the studio burned, although the, the Brooklyn Museum has a big repository of a lot of that stuff. It's so, so fascinating to see how all these different things come together, right? Like we're yeah. used to going to museums and seeing the big painting. There's all these other um, intersections of different media and different ways of, of recording the experience and, and details about the landscape and uh, sketching, photography, all these different, different things. Um, so there's another question here. Was the peak named after Frederick Lander? Yeah. Okay. I, I think Lander probably named it after himself, but I'm not sure. Okay. And another question here. Um, when did Bierstadt fall out of favor and how many of his works remain today? Did Bierstadt meet resistance from the Native Americans who were concerned about him stealing their images? Um, so he fell out of favor uh, in the 18, late 1870s into the 1880s. Uh, people started to consider his work bombastic, which it is, uh, trite, which, I, you know, I don't know. He, he was very prolific, so people were getting a little sick of him. And, you know, taste started changing. This is the era when, um, when French Barbizon painting, sort of small, very realist, very uh, intimate painting is starting to become more popular in the United States. And there's nothing less sort of intimate than one of these big, uh, these big beer shots. And, and then, you know, in 1882, the studio burns, his wife is sick. Uh, and so he really falls out of favor around 1880. Uh, but, you know, his, the, he was very prolific and there are many paintings left. Um, you know, pretty much any of the big museums that have collections of American art are going to have a beer shot. You know, I think, um, uh, you know, the Met has one, the MFA Boston, all the DC museums, uh, the, the in Fort Worth, the uh, uh, Eamon Carter, you know, LACMA, I think might have one, uh, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. So it, his work survives. Uh, he, he painted a lot of these things. Um, but he, yeah, he fell out of favor in the early 1880s and he lived to like 1900. So he had a long second career of trying to figure out how to speak to the new artistic taste and unfortunately mostly failing. 
Um, so uh, as far as pushback from American Indians about capturing his images, um, capturing images, there's no real record of that, but uh, he, it would not have, he wouldn't have cared, you know. He, he didn't care what they thought. That, that's just kind of a fact of, the, um, of how people were. Um, it, was this around the time the national parks were created? Yes. Uh, Yellowstone is founded in 1870-something. Um, that's another, the U.S. National Ge the U.S. Geographic Survey is involved in that. Um, there's a, a photographer named William Henry Jackson and a painter named Thomas Moran uh, who are really involved with that. And Thomas Moran was Bierstadt's big rival in making these big Western scenes. So um, I don't, Bierstadt actually, I don't know if he was interested in the national parks, but he and a, and um, like one of the British royal family, I think one of the princes, tried to create a big ski resort in Colorado. Uh, they were kind of ahead of their time in that they wanted to create this big place where you could go see the real land that Bierstadt um, was painting. But uh, it, the, it, like a lot of land deals, it fell apart, so it never happened. But they were really into the idea of creating their own private resort for their own private gain rather than the national park. Um, and I have a quick question for you, Grant, if um, thinking about, oh, I see a Rollins student who's sending us uh, a met message about becoming more involved with the museum, so we can talk about that for sure. Um, I was wondering if in current conversations about, um, you know, racial relations in this country and talking about um, social inequities or inequalities, I wonder if you have come across um, current discussions about the works by Bierstadt and his representations of Native Americans in the current context and how perhaps we can revisit these images and read them um, in a different light or shed different light on them. Yeah, so, um, you know, the conversation is, in, in some respects, it's really focused on public sculpture right now. Uh, with all the monuments and stuff, but I, I do think that, um, you know, Bierstadt is ripe for a bit of a reappraisal because he he has this reputation as a really cheesy, bombastic painter. And I, and I hoped to get at my talk a bit how um, how he, he might have been more than just that. And if you look at this, this image here, um, the Indian chiefs made at Fort Laramie, you know, the, these are sensitive, individualized portraits of real people. And so I do think, uh, Hisela, that you're absolutely right that, you know, there there could, there could should be, it's time, and maybe, you know, maybe one of us here in this room, maybe me or maybe somebody else will be able to uh, start to do that. My, my dissertation did do a little bit of that, um, it, looking at Bierstadt's representations of Native Americans in terms of German interest in Native Americans, the Germans, uh, like traditionally since the 19th century have, have been very interested, you know, in, in East Germany uh, during the communist era, they would, they would go to summer camps where they dressed like American Indians, um, not, not unproblematic, of course. So, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a conversation worth thinking about. Excellent, thank you. And maybe we have time for one last question. Um, uh, someone sent a message asking if you could talk a little bit more about Bierstadt's relationship to Emmanuel Lutz. Yeah, so Emmanuel Loitza is, um, he was the, uh, the kind of dean of the American uh, group in Dusseldorf. Loitza and Bierstadt are both, um, they're both German immigrants. Bierstadt immigrated with his, with his family to New Bedford from Nord Rhine Westphal when he was like one or two, and Loitze is from Schwäbisch Gmünd, and he immigrates when he's a teenager. Uh, Loitze goes to Philadelphia, Bierstadt to Massachusetts, and then they they're reunited in uh, Dusseldorf. And then you know Loitze is painting in he's a history painter, and Bierstadt is a landscape painter. But they're both using that Dusseldorf aesthetic, which is uh, based on very close observation of nature, but then combined into these big overwrought dramatic uh, presentations. And they also both fall, a favor, fall out of favor 
in the 18, late, Leutze a little sooner. Uh, the Civil War makes the kind of history painting that Leutze does seem particularly uh, pointless, g given how violent and upsetting and grotesque the, 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 the fighting was in the Civil War. Uh, Birsha hangs on for a little bit longer, but um, as far as like any personal relationship or friendship, you know, that's just not, neither painter leaves, left behind much of an archive, so we don't have letters between them or anything like that, but, you know, uh, Loisa was older, um, he was probably a mentor to Bierstadt, they, they would have crossed paths in, a big, a big thing that artists in this period were always trying to do was to get Congress to buy their work, and both Loitze and Bierstadt were trying really hard, but Congress didn't want to pay the prices that they wanted, and so there was a lot of back and forth. And um, so they they might have very well been both in D.C., like in front of the same congressional committees, begging for their stuff to go up in the in the congress in the rotunda. Um, but we don't know about we don't have any good like letters between them the way that we do with some historical figures. Fascinating. Thank you so much, um, Grant. And we have one last message asking, where can we take courses to learn more about artists like Bierstadt um, here at Rollins? I would suggest checking the offerings in the art history, uh, arts and art history department. I would say probably um, courses offered by Dr. Levy and uh, other faculty members in the department. Um, and come to the museum. We'll be sharing more information about the reopening um, soon, and you'll be able to see Albert uh, Bierstadt's uh, work in the place of metaphor. I want to thank all of oh, you one for more joining thing, us Isabella. today. Sure, um, go ahead. Also, I wrote about this work for Work of the Week, and it's available yeah. in our collection website page, so you, you can learn a little more there, too. Yes, thank you for the reminder. So if you go to our website, um, you can um, go to the uh, visit page and there's a tab for work of the week. We have been highlighting um, a week, a work from the collection every Monday um, and you can read more about this painting in that write-up that um, Grant um, published on the website. So thank you again to everyone who joined today for all your questions and comments. We really appreciate it. We miss you and we hope to see you soon. So. Um, please stay tuned for uh, upcoming events. Thank you so much and have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Grant.